Hi, I'm Michael and welcome to Beyond the Screenplay. Today we are looking at The Shining, the 1980 Stanley Kubrick film written by Stanley Kubrick and Diane Johnson based on the book The Shining by Stephen King. I'm joined by the Lessons from the Screenplay team, writer Trisha Arand. Hello everyone. Writer Brian Bittner. Hello. And editor Alex Cayeros. Hi. So The Shining is the most scary movie ever, the end. <laughs> uh, is my feeling anyway. Uh, and, that was a short one. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so revisiting the video for The Shining is really interesting because it was, I think, the first like Halloween horror themed video. Uh, it's video number nine also, which at the time felt like, oh my God, there's mm-hmm. nine of these already and 40 videos later it's like oh this was at the beginning i was uh very afraid to tackle the shining because it really does scare me like there's something just about Mm -hmm. the way it's made that it gets beneath my skin and it's deeply terrifying and i stumbled upon a video from a channel that i I love actually um called vsauce so if anyone doesn't know vsauce it's like this educational channel where they the host kind of raises an idea and then it's like but why is this thing that way and then they start exploring it and they go on to all these tangents um it's a really great channel and there was one video that they made uh on creepiness and why Mm. things are creepy and it was a really interesting video and so from watching that video i found this research paper that he was referencing and i realized that that i think was what was so disturbing to me about The Shining because the paper kind of posits that things are creepy when we can't understand the nature of it. Like that's why masks Mm -hmm. are like scary is because you can't understand what the person under it, what their intentions are. And so we just default to there's something dangerous. We don't know what, but be afraid. And that's kind of the nature of creepiness. And I feel like The Shining from start to finish gives me that feeling. It just has that sense about it. So it's my, I love it even though it's terrifying, it's definitely my favorite Kubrick film um, because it is so effective in this really horrifying way. Well, I think it's always, there's something when you can identify something, when it's solid, when it's like, okay, this is a movie about this monster or this ghost or this thing. Mm -hmm. There's something about that that's kind of comforting and safe and you can kind of just like count on that from then on. But in in a movie like The Shining, you can't really count on anything because the the rules aren't clear. There's, There's kind of a, blurry line between supernatural and just insanity yes and there's and there was so much we can talk about and you covered it in your video as well but just the way the movie doesn't follow the normal conventions of saving scary music for actually scary scenes right. you know like <laughs> you, you're watching these very average quote unquote normal scenes with a really horrifying undertone that's making you just feel very unsettled like something really awful is going to happen any second and so I, I think, yeah, I agree with you that this is one of Kubrick's best films, in my opinion. I, mean, I still think probably 2001 A Space Odyssey is going to always be overall my favorite of his if you have to choose a favorite. But I think this is the second for me. And I think it's also his most kind of mainstream accessible film. Um, yeah. Just watching it again, it's like, wow, this movie really does like escalate quickly. And like it doesn't, you know, it, it, it takes its time in some ways, but also not. Also kind of just gets right to the horror pretty quickly uh, in a way that's really satisfying and and doesn't give you much time to just like relax it It pulls the rug out from under you so early when danny is standing there in that mirror and he has his like first vision and we see that cascade of blood and we Mm -hmm. see it's right there i think it's what 10 minutes in it's really early most yeah Yeah. well it's almost like you could argue it doesn't it saves the horror for later, but it starts right. with just that feeling of creepiness and unease and just something is off. Yeah. Like, I cannot imagine, obviously, so this movie came out in 1980. I wasn't alive. But, like, I can't imagine having never seen this movie, sitting in the theater, and you're 10 <laughs> minutes you're ten minutes into it, and there's just this kid looking in a mirror and talking to his imaginary friend, and all of a sudden there's that cascade of blood. And what's the second image that it goes the, the to? The little girls. Is oh Mm-mm. the twins. Oh. And, and his face screaming. And his Mm-mm. face screaming. Yeah. Just right, right there. Like, <laughs> how do you even find your footing in the movie after that? How do you even know you can't trust anything because they're just going to cut away from something that is fine and normal and domestic and just like regular movie stuff to. Just the editing itself disorients you from the jump. And so you're from that very moment on edge. Yeah, But but I do like that it balances that. It sort of weights it with this 
fairly simple story. You yes. know, I think that if, yeah, if yeah, it yeah. did that every five minutes, you'd just get taken out of it so quickly. Right, but, but it's, it's not a, a story anymore. Yeah. yeah. Totally. I was going to say, but even like the quote unquote, like normal safe stuff happening is unnerving because his like imaginary friend is not like a normal imaginary friend. It has a very <laughs> disturbing voice. It like lives in his mouth. Like th the way he puts it all is just a little bit too off where it's like, okay like yeah he's a kid and he has this imaginary friend and it's a thing but this one feels wrong like this something's wrong with this one i mean it's Tony, not okay tony's the little boy that lives in my mouth is like one of the scariest lines right. i've ever written right. it's just something about it that's so off <laughs> I'm I'm yeah. talking about this. I'm realizing. I wonder if this is where a lot of my issues with imaginary friends oh, come from. Also, like I think they're this all Tony. Is, this is why you don't like Bing Bong. Yeah, like maybe Bing Bong is just <laughs> Tony. Bing Bong is not Tony. He might be. You don't know. You don't know. <laughs> but Sorry. even and like, Tyler Durden. <laughs> but even the opening credit sequence, like I don't know, rewatching it this week, just how those the names go by in the credit sequence like too quickly in a way that's a little bit disorienting it's like we see this in horror movies sometimes where things move a little too quickly right or slightly too quickly like a creature or whatever and that's upsetting to us where it's like it shouldn't be able to move that fast the opening credit sequence is kind of tapping into some of that with the way that the names go from the bottom of the screen all the way to the top but almost just Slightly, right. like ten percent too fast. Also, you've got that. So good. The score. <laughs> well, yeah, so I amazing. just, I think, yeah, from the very first frame, you're uneasy. Yes. And yeah. and Jack Nicholson's performance also is uneasy from start to finish. Even when he's presenting himself as normal nice guy you feel like there's maybe a psychopath like right below the surface i mean it's jack nicholson yeah <laughs> but yeah i mean you it's, don't cast it's, jack nicholson it's in your movie. amazing casting because like you, i'm watching him smile at people supposedly being very polite and i i'm terrified of right. him yeah. and that's what that's one of the m most interesting changes from the book is that like jack or john in the book starts as more of a nice guy and yeah he has a history and such and such but he's he just he has a, a long way to fall when you cast jack nicholson in your movie like everyone's from frame one going uh oh yeah. <laughs> what's gonna happen with this guy well and it, yeah really interesting what you were pointing out in the video which is just that this movie doesn't bother at all to try to hide from you what is going to happen it sets it up really clearly right like that opening scene in the office they tell you the plot of the movie. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know exactly what is going to happen. And then the scariness becomes about how. Yeah, I, I think that was one of the first kind of aha moments I had when I sat down and braved, I'm going to watch this movie and analyze it. I'd seen it a couple of times, actually. It's like it's weirdly one of those scary movies that's so scary, but I still have to watch it sure. occasionally. Um, the because the filmmaking so, is so amazing. Yeah, it's yeah. so effective at what it's trying to do, which is really impressive. But I'd never really sat down and thought about it. And so it was interesting here that in the book, there is more of that kind of traditional, you know, the main character has more of that, like, you know, like you said, a, there's further for him to fall. Mm -hmm. Where I think a standard horror movie would, we'd come in and be mm -hmm. like, oh, we're supposed to think this is a happy family. And mm -hmm. we're going to watch them like slowly go crazy. And I think that's just another one of those unsettling things where you almost have this meta expectation of how I'm supposed to feel about this person. And from the get-go, you feel off about that even. Mm -hmm. There's just no, yeah, you can't get your footing anywhere in this movie. Yeah. What, what I also like about this setup and the family dynamics and some of those early scenes with Shelley Duvall um, mm -hmm. with her son and talking to like the doctor that comes, there's this really interesting subtext through all of it oh yeah where you know she's she has this kind of desperation to her where she's really trying to project that everything's fine i have a happy life you know everything's fine with danny everything's fine with my husband like we're all good but something is very deeply wrong mm -hmm. and everybody's trying to kind of talk around it and so when they're even driving in the car up you know there's this one scene in the car where they're just kind of talking about cannibalism and the, the daughter, daughter party, party. Yeah. and even that even you the mean way they ate each other up <laughs> exactly yeah and just even the way all three of them present themselves in that scene and jack nicholson's you know performance it's just there's something wrong at the core of this family mm -hmm. but they're all putting on smiles and pretending like it's fine mm -hmm. and i just i think that's such an effective uh way to set up the story as opposed to the more traditional like 
all the trailers for every horror movie ever where it's like there's a montage at the beginning of how perfect their life is <laughs> you know it's right. like finally you're back from the military and everything's going to be great and you know here's <laughs> we're on swing sets and everything's happy yeah i love that this movie is not that that it's yeah. just there's something deeply wrong with his family to start with and now it's going to get worse to be yeah. fair that movie was called swing set murders <laughs> 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 Well, that is the that was kind of one of the things I kept running into is this same idea of this creepy mask. Like you were saying, like mm. they're putting on this right. performance, like everyone's trying to act like they're it's all normal. wearing masks. Yeah. Yeah. And like mm. even the Overlook Hotel is such a like pretty beautiful right? place and this like wonderful environment. And it looks like it should be this pretty comfortable, awesome place to spend several months isolated by yourself while snowed in. It just uh, like <laughs> It doesn't make any sense. He's like, well, the road, it's snow and it's a 25 mile stretch of road and there's no way to make it. Vi-. It's just like, it doesn't make any logical sense. And he actually. wants, like, he he wants a writer's retreat. This is perfect. I mean, <laughs> and even if you were wintering over. So like I wrote something about people who winter over in the South Pole which is not very many people, by the way, um, and is the plot of another great, fantastic horror movie. Um, but people who winter over, even at the South Pole, they have to like, they have all of these precautions. We have to get medically checked out and all of this stuff and you psychologically evaluated and they take your appendix out like before you go to the South Pole for the winter. Oh my God, just in case. Just in case. Yeah. Because that's the thing. If you're not going to have access to a doctor, you have to be approved by a doctor to be, you know, out of touch, that far out of touch. So it's just like, no, no, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to criticize this movie. It's pr- <laughs> It's pretty awesome setup. I'm just saying it's like, if there were even the slightest chance that you would get snowbound somewhere like that for months, there would be more precautions in place. Even in the seventies, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna venture to say. Well, I think that's again what's so like weirdly striking about it is that it, yeah, it, it does, it's not plausible. I feel like there are kind of weird horror movie things where it's like, oh, okay, I guess that's what's gonna happen, or at least that's <laughs> how I would feel in a normal horror movie. Mm. But for some reason, you know, it's it's almost like you know this script in the hands of somebody else would have been a terrible movie. But just like the way it's executed, like it manages to not care about those things. Right. It's okay being a horror movie. And then now we're also going to make it this amazing film. This script doesn't exist in the hands of somebody else. It never could. It was being written on set. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It was written directly out of the minds of the people who were making it as they were making it. So it's not like there's some magical version of the script out there and somebody else could have interpreted it differently. It doesn't work in, in that sense. And you have that quote in your, uh, in your video, Michael, about Kubrick saying a script isn't made to be read. It's made to be realized by the filmmaker, which I feel like the, what a luxury. Uh, yeah. Right. Like, yeah, the idea <laughs> of that thanks. is fine. <laughs> but if you're already Stanley Kubrick and you can afford to do yeah, that, yeah. yeah, it's a luxury. I would love if nobody had to read my script before I just got to make it <laughs> exactly. with all the money. Yeah. <laughs> right. That'd be a lot easier of a process. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I wish I wish we had done this podcast three years ago because I had spent a lot of time researching the writing process because there is interestingly like a book mm-hmm. written about it I think by Diane Johnson the co-writer she, she has been pretty forthcoming throughout yeah, yeah I, I was reading a few different interviews with her too she's you know as impenetrable as Kubrick the legend is Diane mm-hmm. Johnson's kind of like I read The Shining let's talk about it <laughs> <laughs> yeah and just the the process of how they approached it and how they used the book but then threw things out immediately I again I can't remember the details but it was I feel like this is also one of those cases where how it was made is also so fascinating and clearly like seeped into the final movie. Like Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the movie is about, you know, a family quietly going insane together. And it feels like the process of making it was a production team (laughs) quietly going insane insane together. Yeah. It's just really fascinating. And yet you talk about the, uh, the sort of mask and the, the uh, unfamiliarity of it all. And, and, is that a word? Yeah. Unfamiliar. You got it. Yeah. Unfamiliaritude. I, I think that that's something we talked about with Tarantino with tension, mm-hmm. where you can build tension and you can be a master of building tension, but you have to pay it off. And I think the same is true of creepiness and sort of scaring and that kind of thing. Uh, a movie that came to mind when I was thinking about The Shining was The Others. The Nicole I Kim. love that movie. I wanted to love it. And I have never watched it a second time, so I have no idea how I'd feel. I just remember feeling so creeped out by it the entire time and then at the end 
there was nothing. Right. And that, yeah, and yeah. that is sort of the point of the text of the movie. Mm-hmm. It, you know, I won't spoil the ending for anyone who hasn't seen it, but but it was just frustrating to be watching a movie on edge the whole time. But then I wanted to be scared a little bit. You know, I think The Shining does a good job of making you feel on the, on the edge of your seat, sort of like you're not quite grounded, like you can't quite catch your footing for a lot of the time. But then it also scares you. It also has moments that are just it's a pretty good, and, pretty good payoff. Yeah, exactly. It's a, <laughs> yeah. Good, it's a good Yeah. And the big story payoff of the end of the movie, too, yeah. not to mention just like little scary moments in between. Um, so, yeah, I just thought it was an interesting thing to think about. And then most horror movies do the opposite where they're like, everything's fine. And then now now you're scared. And it's like, well, that didn't I don't care. (laughs) (laughs) Just showing me like a ghost that suddenly wasn't there is not scary as like making me feel uneasy the whole time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But this does have a few things in common with the others. And I think, well, first of all, I just love the idea of a period horror movie because some of the like logical things that I have a problem with here where it's like, okay, so he took the thing with the radio and then he like took the pieces out of the snow cat. Okay, mm-hmm. great. Like you have to do some of that logistical maneuvering, but when it's just like, well, it's the 1860s, mm-hmm. like you don't have to do <laughs> There are no things. phones. There there's no, no options. Yep. Yeah. There's nothing you can do. And like your kids are allergic to light. So guess you're trapped in this house forever. I mean, when, sorry, that's the premise of the others. Nicole Kidman's <laughs> really? children are allergic to light. So she like, locks them all in this haunt, haunted house basically and it's like this is where we live now <laughs> and we have to keep all the drapes drawn you haven't seen the others and... i know i've seen it but i haven't seen it since it came out i forgot about I, the other yeah, light. i don't remember anything <laughs> yeah but it, ge- it gives you that claustrophobia that is also i right. think you know a pretty effective obviously any sort of movie like this this very contained claustrophobic you know trapped in a a haunted place essentially and there's no way out is borrowed straight out of the shining like all of it comes basically back to this as probably one of the most influential horror movies ever made so but yeah i I agree with you i think that um it is remarkably good at sustaining that tension the others is remarkably good at sustaining that tension but that goes back to do you know what's going to happen or do you not Mm -hmm. and in the shining we know exactly what's going to happen and that's why we're scared Right. It's. I mean, it goes back to that Alfred Hitchcock quote about the the bomb under the table. The bomb under the table. Um, yeah. yeah, not <laughs> that one. That one does exist. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that one does exist. Yes, there's yeah, video of him saying that. Knowing one. <laughs> about the bomb under the table is more suspenseful than a bomb suddenly going off. Exactly. Right. And the fact that the whole time Jack Nicholson basically is this time bomb and his face is terrifying because as the movie progresses, even really early, his face is about to like morph into like a horrible thing, but just doesn't quite get there. It's like a smile that's like pretty creepy, but like you can still excuse it as like maybe normal. That's just his face. But it <laughs> does again, the, it's Jack. Nicholson. Yeah. <laughs> but like, but for so much of the movie, I'm just on edge watching him in, in the most normal of scenes, like mm-hmm. eating breakfast, sopping up his eggs with the bacon. Weird, you know, like it, even that scene freaks me out. Well, it's, it's, it's also something Michael talked about in the video of the the sound design and the, and the score. It's just oh, so the, the fact that there's kind of scary music. You know, I talked about this in the Shaun of the Dead podcast. It's like Wednesday. Wham! Like, <laughs> I'm, I'm terrified. And then sometimes there are scenes where something scary happens, but the music doesn't yeah. tell you. So your brain has to sort of right. understand that you're seeing something scary. You know, it's like if someone totally. jumps out at you but doesn't scream, you're like your brain doesn't know how to like manage those two things. Hey, listeners, Brian here to tell you that this episode of Beyond the Screenplay is sponsored by Mubi, not the fast food cow from the Kevin Smith films, the curated streaming service showing exceptional films from around the globe. So I tried out Mubi recently and I watched the Ken Loach film, My Name is Joe. I'd been wanting to up my Ken Loach game for years and the film stars Peter Mullen, who I love as an actor, so it seemed like a no brainer. Um, But I may never have even seen this movie if it weren't for the way the service works, which is that every day Mubi premieres a new film. From cult classics to award-winning masterpieces, forgotten gems to festival-fresh independent releases, from the hard-to-find to the never-heard-of-that-before. With Mubi, each and every film is hand-selected by an actual human, never an algorithm. You can try Mubi for free for 30 days at Mubi.com slash beyond the screenplay. That's M-U-B-I dot com slash beyond the screenplay. If you were to just go to the website without using our link, you only get a seven-day free trial. But Beyond the Screenplay listeners get a whole month of great cinema for free. So again, head to movie.com slash beyond the screenplay or click on the link in our show notes to start your 30-day trial of movie. In doing so, you'll be helping to support the show and you'll get access to a service that I think you'll like. Thanks to movie for sponsoring Beyond the Screenplay. 
went to see the music center uh, downtown, the Walt Disney Music Music Hall, whatever it's yeah, called. Yeah, yeah. Um, the LA Philharmonic play a bunch of Kubrick uh, cool. music to what? the film. Like, to I the want different this. Scenes. It was awesome. <laughs> but the cool thing is with the shiny. So, and then I went to a lecture beforehand about how he did his score work and stuff which of course because it's kubrick also included him hiring someone to do a score and then saying and then nah. never minding <laughs> yeah. them yeah um but one of the things he did was he found these really avant-garde uh composers and not only would he take their weird ass music and put it in his movies he would take multiple tracks and just put them together at the same mm-hmm. time so then i got to see the orchestra playing a track oh, cool. that was multiple things that had been wow. layered together by Kubrick and then now was being recreated live by this How orchestra, cool. which is, yeah, it was pretty cool. That's amazing. Oh, and also it was hosted by Malcolm McDowell, who just came out of and course, told Clockwork Orange stories. So <laughs> yeah. had that on top. Yeah. The best. You know, we mentioned sound design as well. And I feel like one of my like prototypical memories of just like when my brain was aware of sound design just being amazing mm. was one of those early tracking shots of Danny riding on his bike, his mm. little tricycle. Yeah. And the sound is so mixed, is mixed so loud of just the, the carpet yeah, and the, the wood. The, floor. the sound of the wood, really loud grinding sound, almost kind of horrifying after a while. And then it it's like so precisely uh changes Quiet. when it goes on the carpet and then yeah. back to the wood and back to the carpet. And it, it just takes this once again very theoretically pleasant ordinary moment of a child riding a tricycle and makes it sonically very disturbing and unnerving and wrong kind of and it just I, I couldn't believe how powerful the sound design was and think about this is 1980 it feels like a very modern film as far as the quality of the sound mm-hmm. design and we all knew what you were going to say the, right. Like, yeah, yeah. Like, right. that, like oh yeah the, the yeah. noisy floor and then the quiet carpet yeah. just that yeah well, and what's interesting also is that like how much technology kind of enabled this movie to happen. Like, mm. I think that's another reason why it was kind of this miraculous thing was like the steady cam had just mm-hmm. been invented. Oh, and tracking so, shots. Yeah, like so much of this movie is shot on steady cam and like the guy who invented it did all the shots. Like he Kubrick convinced him to come and spend <laughs> months and months like shooting this movie. And so getting shots like that where we're right behind Danny on the the bicycle and like doing those turns and exploring those spaces like could only have happened because of the invention of the steady cam. The steady cam had been used before in movies, but it was mostly like, oh, when someone's going down the stairs, like it was a way to fix things that you couldn't shoot other ways. And The Shining was the first movie to be like, no, let's use this as a tool to make the camera tell the story in a way we couldn't do any other way and put you in that space. And, it, and just the way the film plays with space also. Oh, oh, of course. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, there's so many amazing shots that kind of track horizontally through the space where you're passing through walls and pa- not, not only really passing through walls, but you, you have a sense of the geography of the space in a way that I don't get in most films. You know, you see Shelley Duvall pushing like a breakfast cart through the hotel and you see her pass the entire lobby area, and but it's intentionally nonsensical geography, right? It's, it's still thing. it's still disorienting, but I don't no. know. Okay, yeah. so yes. is that confirmed? Yes, it is. Okay, so I was reading something by the uh, set designers essentially, and they were saying like because of all the tracking shots, that is sort of why they ended up having to like they they obviously couldn't go up and down a ton of stairs in those tracking shots. So they were building these sort of labyrinthine hallways, but then also the disorientation is, is purposeful just based on like, I can't confirm I guess other than the hallways, but I do know that the, the fact that every single thing seems to be like, it's in a different style, like decorated in a different style. Like why would that super modern bathroom be in this like attached to this super traditional 1920s right. looking ballroom that doesn't make any sense and then you have like this native american inspired hall like huge entrance hall and then you have these like sort of mid 70s room hallway corridor things all of that's very intentional that it's supposed to be this weird hodgepodge that is part of the disorientation actually yeah. is yeah. the lack of consistent style yeah yeah i think i think i just get very dubious of any sort of they did this for this this reason because i've seen the documentary uh, room 237 mm-hmm. which have you guys seen <laughs> i've no, I've heard okay. a lot about it. It's, it's pretty interesting because I remember I was just like, I'll throw it on. And a few, uh, there's just all these different theories about, oh, Kubrick filmed the moon landing and this is proof. And as soon right, as I right, saw yeah, yeah. that poster of the guy skiing in the background, I knew that was him, his little Easter egg, blah, blah, blah. And I'm watching the movie going, uh, the documentary going like, wait a minute, even if one of these things is true, 
this movie is like eight ninths like BS because right. obviously they can't all be true. Uh, and then I realized, oh, that's kind of the point of it. And then I realized yes. that was what the, the, the doc makers were doing was they were just mm-hmm. showing you all these things. But, you know, like we talked about the social network. Well, if you're writing a script based on three testimonies, like your right. movie is one third true at best. Right. Um, and I think it's, sim- it's a similar thing. Like it almost by, by showing you all these theories, it almost devalues all the theories because you're like, yeah, look how many the- theories there are out here. You can try to prove them if you want, but whatever. I mean, the entire point of The Shining is ambiguity. Mm-hmm. The plot right. itself doesn't make any sense. The conclusion doesn't the ending, make any sense. Yeah, like, right. None of it makes any sense. And so to assert that it was intentionally designed as something of a Rorschach test thematically like and just from a plot perspective is not a theory like the fact that no one can agree on what this movie means i think is the point Mm -hmm. and has never been able to everything seems meticulously selected and shot with so much intention and weight and yet it sort of adds up to not one thing thematically the only thing thematically it adds up to is ambiguity that's true. And I, I think it's just like this really interesting thin line between like intentional ambiguity and accidentally this thing doesn't make sense. It's interesting to watch people react to that. Like, I think that's what I find fascinating is the ambiguity is cool because it makes us want to think and figure out our own answers and engage with, you know, that's the reason these movies last so long in, in many ways is because we want to keep talking about them and thinking about them. Um, but it just it is interesting when it gets to the like it was purposefully designed architecturally to like screw with people like I would not be surprised if you looked at the interiors of any movie set and it didn't make sense like it didn't architecturally hold together right I think what's interesting to me is that when people need to believe that the ambiguity was intentional like start to bottom or like you know what I mean? Start, start to finish. Start to finish. Start to finish. Talk, start to finish. Talk to to finish. Choose, choose a metaphor. I like to mix them. I like it to it's be ambiguity. ambiguity. Yeah. ambiguity. Start. Purposefully oh, ambiguous. I'm a disturbed. penny saved is worth two in the bush. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you can have both. I mean, I think you can have a movie that is intentionally ambiguous, but maybe not every single ambiguity you found was exactly an intentional right. thing. Ambiguous. But I think it's clear that ambiguity is a yes. Kubrick thing, like an intentional ambiguity. That's 2001 A Space Odyssey. <laughs> Yeah. It's the most ambiguous movie ever, basically. And it's intentionally so because the book that was co-written at the same time, the novel version, is much less ambiguous. And Arthur C. Clarke was actually quite upset at mm-hmm. Kubrick for how ambiguous he made the film intentionally, mm-hmm. knowing the actual story. I think one of my favorite Alex quotes from the podcast is, why is there a space baby? Why is he looking at me? <laughs> <laughs> is that, yeah, is that when About I shared, shared my fear of fetuses? <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, here's the thing. He's basing this on a book by Stephen King that is thematically cohesive. It is about alcoholism and and it is about like this family that's deteriorating and put under this stress and whatever. A lot of the stuff that makes the book thematically one thing, Kubrick purposefully took out or like messed with and then added in a bunch of stuff that isn't there. It's like, is it actually... Is it coming from Jack? Is Jack the one that's going insane? Or is has he been seized by something? Is what Danny is seeing real? Why does Grady have two different first names? Is there only one ghost named Grady? Is the Delbert Grady the middle name of Charles Grady? When, <laughs> like, There's no need for you to do that, Kubrick, unless you are purposefully trying to say something ambiguous. So like, he's clearly messing with it on purpose in a way that he doesn't need to be doing unless his point is to be in- inspiring us in 2019 to record this podcast. It's all for us. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's it's an interesting, as someone who likes math, I want to find the solution to the equation and study everything art, objectively. <laughs> art is just really complex science. And... <laughs> oh, no. Ruining the magic. <laughs> no, I think... No, I mean, I... I I do kind of think that. But, I mean, I think human brains are extremely complicated. And We're all just computers. Well, I mean, we are. I think in a lot of ways, there's a lot of similarities. And I think if you could study everything that was happening in the brain, you would be able to understand why we act, react to things. And it's impossible right now, in 2019 anyway. So we have this distinction between art and science, and they're different things, and we laugh about it. But I think that, like... 
there's still something really interesting in the pursuit of what is that line? Why is this shining good? Because it was intentionally ambiguous. And what, like, why do we say, oh, it's so good that he like intentionally did this. And that's the theme versus another movie where it's like, these are plot holes and it doesn't really make sense. And it's kind of ambiguous. Like, I, I think it's when, when there's a level of craft present, you know, when there's a level of craft present mm -hmm. that is clearly intentional, like you can't doubt that the cinematography and the way the sound design is constructed and the way the actors were directed all are crafted with a lot of care. So I think I think when you see a movie that is crafted poorly in every respect, then it's easier to see things that could be called plot holes as like accidents and things that were like just right. sloppy. But there's nothing sloppy about the construction of this film. So it's harder to to say, oh, well, he just like screwed up the plot well, like, even, by, even by he, accident. Even yeah, if he yeah. did screw up, you can argue it doesn't matter because right. you don't know. You know, is the entire plot of The Shining happening in his head? Okay, if it is, who opened the storeroom door for him? You know what right. I mean? Like the movie is not a movie that needs to be logically cohesive in order right. to work. Whether or not some of the choices were made because he forgot when he wrote page 112 that his name was Charles instead of whatever, you know, uh, I have no it's idea. It's possible. Yeah. Right. I think I think at one point they say the girls are eight and 10, but then they're twins when you see them. So it's like you'd have no idea how much is accident versus how much is intentional. But the the fact is, in my opinion, it doesn't matter for a movie like The, the Shining. The fact in your opinion. The fact. <laughs> <laughs> The Art facts science. he believes in his opinion. Opinions yeah. and facts, I get them messed up. <laughs> There's a lot of Inside Out references happening. <laughs> so, who would have thought? I don't know. Going back to what we were talking about, you said it doesn't matter. I agree with you, but I think the main reason I agree with you is because the plot is actually quite simple. Right. I think that the more knots you try to tie in a plot the more that we sort of lose faith in what you're doing on purpose versus what you're letting drop through, which is is sort of what you were saying. I recently was researching, did a deep dive and was researching the movie Us, which I think is heavily influenced by this movie, as most horror movies are these days. That movie is also quite obviously very purposefully designed to be loaded with symbols, loaded with different themes, and ambiguous as to what it exactly is saying about any of them mm -hmm. and there is but but the plot is complicated enough that i think it lost a lot of people especially right. as the movie went on right because there isn't that elegant simplicity we have exactly four characters in the shining kind of i mean they, okay so we have um halloran um and then we have grady so i guess that's five and Lloyd, but it's like you have four characters yeah. who are Main. actually there. Right, right. Yeah. 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 Um, so Corporeally. Just, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, think, I think the more contained and the more simplistic it is, the more we're willing to sort of like give you this space to explore things in a more metaphorical or metaphysical sense. And we're not sort of nailing you down to plot issues. Whereas in something like us, it has to do with the more modern audience as well that's expecting get out when, you know, we already made that. Um, uh. <laughs> I have thoughts on us. Fun. Yeah. I'm reserving them right now. It's fine. It's fine. I, I'm not defending the movie. I'm just saying it makes sense because the plot is complex that then the audience is trying to track with a plot that then is purposefully ambiguous. Of course, that's frustrating. But when the plot right. is simple, mm -hmm. it's a little bit in, easier. In The Shining, you're not as led to expect hard rules mm -hmm. in this world. Yeah. And I think us, the way it's constructed makes you kind of expect harder rules yeah. and when the rules don't seem coherent or you can't really find them right it's actually frustrating whereas in the shining yeah i never really even assume i'm gonna get any rules it's not the, that kind of movie right it reminds yeah. me of uh in college when mulholland drive came out mm. my friend liz and i went on a friday night to see it for the first time and then the following friday we said you want to go again and then we went five times uh, in over five Fridays to see Mulholland Drive. And I think around the third time, we started being able to understand what the actual plot of the movie was. Mm -hmm. So then we could start talking about what it meant. Wow. <laughs> I love which, that movie yeah, so much. Which, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that's a good thing for a movie to do. That's, <laughs> that's absolutely against the point you're making, which is if the plot is simple, then you're allowed to play with everything else. Right. Uh, but that was, you know, that was the sort of barrier to entry from Mulholland Drive was let's 
watch it a couple times so we can actually know what the plot of the movie is. Mm -hmm. Then we can start talking about yeah, what, yeah, it yeah. Really, what the kind of meta story of the movie is right. to then begin interpreting it. Right. Uh, that's, yeah. And that's, you know, if you have the patience, great. <laughs> if you yes, love David you, Lynch like if I you do. Wanna, if you want to do that, it's very rewarding. Yeah. The cool yeah. thing about fairy tales and fables and, and these kinds of stories that are, they're simple. That's why we are able to access them and then like think about what they mean and tell them and retell them. Um, which I think The Shining very much operates in that sense. It's kind of a fable, right? Yeah. yeah. I I really appreciate that analysis. Like, I think that's why I like doing this, like, art is science. So let's figure it out and take it apart until we figure out how it works. Because I feel like I have a, an answer now to that, where, like, the focus of the story, like you're saying, isn't the plot. So when the plot doesn't make sense, that doesn't matter because that's not what we're operating on. And I think that is a good comparison with us where it is very much like you want to know what's going to happen and then they tell you and it's like that doesn't make any sense that that's what happened so why was that the focus uh so yeah it's just interesting that i anytime i see humans these other beings that i am not apparently <laughs> these whenever humans. i see it <laughs> uh, art <laughs> is a uh, a science and uh, <laughs> if we Hmm. If we want to make the perfect film, we should do the math and uh, divide. Isn't that what LFTS is? I have a lab coat on constantly <laughs> when I'm analyzing my scripts. Um, but it's it just, it's interesting. I think Mulholland Drive is another example where it's so subjective. It feels like, you know, like I, I you probably could not pay me to watch Mulholland Drive again. Mm -hmm. it was have you only painful. seen it once? I think I've seen like one and a half times. <laughs> And you know, like, like the way to interpret it or the way to like I frame it. Don't like that is so frustrating <laughs> to me. Of like, not every movie should be this, but I think it's fun yeah. once in a while to have a movie that is that. Right. Like, why like, not have a movie movies like that? can be different things, and that's like fine and good <laughs> and stuff. Uh, it's just it's interesting to me that they can be so many things, and you know that sometimes simply saying like, no, it was intentional, that it doesn't make sense makes makes someone want to know like figure it out and i'm not saying that's a bad thing that's just a really interesting aspect of filmmaking that i like to think about and try to approach from yeah and, and it's it is utterly subjective because i think you can also argue there are movies that end up being quote-unquote ambiguous that don't show a level of craft right that shows intentionality and but somebody could watch it and you know argue that's intentional, you know, it's all intentional, but I think subjectively I would watch it and say, I don't know, I think that was just lazy. Well, I think sure. something I come back to a lot is one reason I love Kubrick and I love David Lynch is I'm entertained when I watch their movies, period. Like right. I enjoy watching right. them. Uh, and I think that if Michael doesn't want to go back and rewatch Mulholland Drive because he didn't enjoy the experience, then that movie wasn't well made in his opinion and that's totally right. fine you know i'm not going to make an argument Mulholland drive is a well made movie cuz i don't know how i would make that argument um i know that i personally find a david lynch movie entertaining and that makes me want to go back and watch it again and wonder yeah, there's a sensibility it. To, to it yeah i just have to say one thing really fast i am at this moment about halfway through my first viewing of dune oh <laughs> Oh, and... which David Lynch disowned. Oh, I know. <laughs> Not the best but example. somebody made it. <laughs> yeah. That's his Alien 3. Oh, <laughs> boy, oh, boy. Uh, yeah, so. And Stanley Kubrick disowned Spartacus of all of his films. He's like, nah, wasn't very good. Yeah. Well, and, mm -hmm. Stephen, and Stephen King is very, very unhappy with The Shining. I mean. So interesting thing about the adaptation, other than the differences. So then Stephen King wrote Dr. Sleep which is a sequel to his book. Now, The Shining, the movie, is very different to The Shining, the book. And now they're making Dr. Sleep, the movie, which at least in the marketing materials, references... The movie. The Shining, yeah. the movie. So it's like... Well, of course, from a which, financial standpoint, it has to be a sequel right, to but from a writing, The Shining. But from a writing standpoint, which thing are you sequelizing? That's an interesting challenge, actually, yeah. for the screenwriters. Yeah, I'm sure they'll nail it. I will say... <laughs> oh, Wow. It does not look good, and and just as we talked about with um with Terminator Two and Dark Fate, like it's going to be weird. Just the fact that it looks like a normal movie is weird to say. Oh, it's a sequel to Shining, but it looks normal. Right, it looks right. very but typical Hollywood. I did yeah. love um Haunting of Hill House, and Mike Flanagan is the person who's making it. So okay. if there's any part of me, I, I kind of want to see it no matter what because I'm just curious. But I feel like if there's anyone I've seen make 
a horror thing recently who I would want to helm a follow up to The Shining, it would be him. I still don't have high hopes. I mean, it's like Terminator Dark Fate. It's like, why not? I'm going to see uh-huh. it. Why not? But yeah. I feel like it probably depends on like what what they're trying to do. Like like you said, if they're trying to juggle all these things and be everything to everyone and what a sequel right. to The Shining could be, I feel like that's an impossible task. But right. maybe they go in with a specific idea and just like make the hell out of that. And then it's mm-hmm. fun to the people. We'll see. Right. It's fun too. From a writing standpoint, I feel very empathetic towards Stephen King. I I feel how it would be super frustrating if you had like written this incredibly rich novel that was he poured a lot of himself into, you know, I guess at the end of the day, that's kind of the thing. Like Stephen King is obsessed with writers and writing. Obviously, if you've read a decent number of his books, you know that. And so for me, The Shining is not really ambiguous at all. It's about being a writer. Mm. Like it's (laughs) it's actually that's something I wanted to bring up, actually, was like there's something that it captures so authentically Ooh. about the horror of the writing <laughs> of process. Being a writer. And I feel like I've had that experience before of I'm going to go on a writer's retreat. I have this week. I have this free time. Mm-hmm. I'm going to finally write the thing. And there's almost like it's almost more crushing than when you're just in your normal life and not having time to write when you finally have time to write. And then you feel that writer's block and nothing's coming. Yep. There's almost, it's almost like a depth of despair that is, there's a source of horror in it. And I think they they just use that in this movie in a brilliant way. The scene where, which apparently was, uh, according to legend, was improvised by Jack Nicholson, where he goes off on Wendy for mm. like interrupting him while Whenever he's I'm in writing. Here. Yeah. Yeah. If you hear me typing, even if you don't hear me typing, like <laughs> yeah. I'm working. I watched that. I was watching that scene this week and I was with my partner and I was like, wow, what a jerk. And my partner looked at me and was like, excuse me. (laughs) (laughs) He's like, uh, you said that exact thing to me. I "I definitely have not. Well, and even her, she's trying to be really nice. She's like, I'd love to read what you've written. Like, how's it coming? How's the writing coming? And just those like innocent questions that are like, if you're a normal person, you just think like that's a nice thing to ask a writer. <laughs> but like <laughs> it can be the most like triggering, horrible thing to ask a writer. <laughs> I just I, there's so much of that in this movie that I think does come over from the Stephen King novel. In, yes, at least it's 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 that part of it is honored, which I think is so well captured. They did make a mini series in '97, which was more of a true adaptation of the novel. Mm. Um, and I always was curious. I wanted to watch it and everything, and then. Um, I decided to watch it before this and about 20 minutes in I remembered I didn't have to because uh, <laughs> it's not very good I don't uh, know how I could watch anything else besides the Kubrick Shining well because yeah. I haven't read the book I was curious to see the plot of the book put on film but once it was like a flashback to to Steven Weber as John Torrance uh, being not very nice to Danny and saying, I'll fix you. I was oh like, boy. okay, I'm not going to watch this. <laughs> I'm turning this off right now. It's one of those lightning in a bottle movies mm. also mm-hmm. where it's just For like, sure. and, and I think that's also the thing that I, I, not to keep coming back to the intentional thing, but because, you know, the production was what it was. Like you couldn't, you couldn't make this movie twice. Like you can mm. be intentional with some things, but when you're making a movie, things go wrong and you have to improvise. And even if you have, if you're Fincher and you have ridiculous control over everything, you can't control what If you're Kubrick and you have ridiculous right. control over exactly. everything. It's weird that like we as humans like aren't good at being okay with that, where it's like we, there's this one thing and it was magically perfect and we don't need any more. It's like, well, it's so special. We want more. Like, keep doing. Like, make a sequel. Make Dark Knight Rises. Like, we want all these extra things. Because <laughs> I don't know this- if I don't know if that's who we are as people. I think that's producers and studios sure. and, and people who are profiting off of the magic that you create. But we then give them the money and go see it, though. I, I, I feel like it's it's. It's a shared responsibility. Listen, it's the, the Jurassic World the are our fault. I fully <laughs> right. understand no, right. that. Yeah, exactly. They they are, we've species. all paid to see these movies. They are our fault. <laughs> they continue to be our fault. As the like, Velociraptors evolve, we de-evolve. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I but I think there's, I, I like the point you're making, Michael, because I think all movies are lightning in a bottle. You know, I think mm. there's so many happy accidents or things that seem like very unhappy accidents that turn out to be what leads to a stroke of brilliance in every film film production from the writing process all the way through the edit. And I think 
you really can't recreate the exact conditions of any moment in time ever again. And this movie is special. I mean, the performance by Shelley Duvall, and we can talk about like, you know, what Kubrick did to her to get that performance, which probably is unethical. But I love her in this movie. I it's love it's her in this it's movie. hard it's hard for me to hold both those things at one time because I, yeah. I agree with you, Michael. You can get into that of I don't think it's probably healthy to psychologically break your actors down. <laughs> but she's also she's also just so amazing in this film. And I've never seen a horror movie in which you know a protagonist is reacting in a way that I think actually I probably would if I was like broken down and desperate. And you know, I would probably not be able to swing a bat either. I would probably <laughs> just be very pathetic and just, you know, paralyzed and very poor at doing basic things if I was that scared. And I just I love seeing that in a movie. Yeah, I mean it's, and she's such a it's such a sort of delicate casting almost. You know, yeah. it's someone that that I think that it frustrates me that she is the only female character in the movie and she is just sort of not really doing much and blah 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 but it sort of is this like meditation on this sort of domestic relationship where yeah. she just keeps making excuses granted she physically can't leave but she just keeps making excuses as you said as yeah. you pointed out Alex in that opening scene of her saying well you know he just he just hit, pushed him a little too hard and da 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 and she sort yeah. of is keeps reminding herself and for that character Shelley Duvall is a is a brilliant choice because Absolutely. she is because you don't almost don't want someone who is you don't want Sigourney Weaver or you don't want yeah. you know, like someone she, who's she has like, a deep vulnerability to her mm -hmm. she seems very fragile in a lot of ways and she, she's kind of just barely holding it together herself and that's what I love about her performance too because she has this kind of desperation in her positive outlook on things you know like it's all gonna be great and Danny's gonna love it and but you you feel that she's hiding a woundedness beneath mm -hmm. the kind of positive statements she's making and she's desperate for human connection you know that that i think it's a really sad scene when she radios the forest oh rangers gosh. early on that scene just wanting like some human connection because she's not getting any from her husband yeah um and i i really feel for her in this movie and i really identify with her yeah. it's a very empathetic thing of it's yeah. something we all do we try to paint things in the best light most of the time to right. just keep getting by because to actually address the problems is like far too frightening so it's like no it's all fine everything's fine no i mean especially this time around when i was watching her performance i there are some moments when like it really starts to get bad especially towards the end when she's running around the hotel and she's basically a, a weepy mess you almost want to shake her and just be like pull it together you have to be stronger than this you have to like figure it out her and... ragdoll run oh my gosh yeah yeah, yeah. i it's... love it <laughs> yeah, yeah i, love I feel it. like it, it that's i feel like that's what's so scary is that it feels like right. honest too real well, right. because I, I feel like yeah. the, the movie version usually is yeah the more right. ripley like I'm terrified, but I'm gonna like pull it together. Right. And I love seeing a movie where it's like this person does not have the capacity to pull it together, and right. they're not going to pull it together. Well, and again, going back to the, just the whole setup of what the plot is, Jack Torrance is a bad dude. He has been a bad dude from long before he got to the Overlook Hotel. Basically, you get the sense that he's this inherently selfish person that has not paid enough attention to his family, isn't great at connecting with his son, has probably, you know, we never get any textual hint of this, but probably has knocked around his wife before, especially when he was drinking. Like, you get sort of these signs and signals from the very outset that he is very capable of being dangerous. And her performance is also what gives it that, that authenticity where she has this sort of, like, fragility to her where you sense that she is genuinely afraid of this person she married but you know now she has her son and she has she's like trying to weigh all of these things together and, and just trying to keep it together if she can keep the marriage together if she can if it's going to be safe for Danny to do so right and kind of almost put a delusional yeah. sheen on everything I that mean, you know I mean, it's absolutely. all it's all really okay right yeah. and, and I know that Stephen King has really criticized the way that Wendy is portrayed in this movie because he the character in the book is so much more resilient and smart and you know more independent sort of woman and Kubrick wanted to change that because he basically felt it would be or read sort of as unbelievable if a much stronger woman was with this person who's pretty much abusive to her, verbally at very least. 
Right? Absolutely. That's that's early in the movie. He's early in verbally the movie. Abusive. Verbally abusive. Yeah. And so he's like, look, if you have a stronger character from the outset, then we don't buy that she's still here or that she would even agree to do any of this. And so, and then letting her, I think, find a strength and find a resolve. I mean, she wins. She does. You know, she wins mm-hmm. at the end. Yeah. I I truly love her in this movie. Um, and, I, and I like that conscious choice to make that change. Yeah. You know? Yeah, definitely. I think it works really well. And and then tying her so closely to Danny, I know that in the book, Danny and his dad actually have like a better relationship. But in the movie, when she finds that his sweater is torn and she finds that mark on his neck after he goes into room 237, and then she turns to Jack and she's like, you did this. You did this yeah, I mean, for she, sure. She's, she's strong in that moment. You know, yes. She's not always, you know, mm-hmm. when, when it comes to her son, she is protective. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think it all works really well, like from a character standpoint. I agree with all this, and her performance is great. And I, I do feel like her arc in the movie is like resonant and feels powerful by the end. Like mm-hmm. when she does take that stand, it is like, okay, good. Yeah, like let's do it. I'm on when your she's side. She's dragging him into the thing. I'm just like, yes, <laughs> lock him up. Like, yeah, so good. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, I think just to like go back really quickly to how the performance was gotten. I feel like that's maybe another thing that I hang under, you know, the hierarchy of uh, celebrating intentionality too much yeah. because I think people can look at how a thing was made, not understand that like maybe that wasn't the best way to make it and then be like, oh, well, you have to do that in order to get this result. Yeah. I'm kind of talking to both like film school, me and other people that I knew in film school where it was like celebrating the suffering that happened to happen, I think, with some of these great films can make you feel like, well, then doing suffering means I'm making something good. Right. right. Well, yeah, if, if my actors like are actually psychologically distraught on set, that's I'm winning because, you know. <laughs> right. Like, and right. it's OK because The Shining did it. Right. right? Everyone loves The Shining. And so yeah. I feel like that's just the... I worry that people take the wrong lessons right. from those. Where once again, it, it does, does not take into account the lightning in a bottleness. You know, the maybe this can't be repeatedness of it. Nor should it. Yeah. You know, I I really appreciate what you're saying, Michael, because that new filmmaker, new Hollywood school of those guys. You know, we know now that a lot of their methods were incredibly unethical. Um, and I would say, eh, not not even maybe, definitely some of them criminal. And this ends justify the means thing mm-hmm. that I think that we get sometimes from art is something I just inherently reject. Like there's a very professional way to make movies to treat all of the people on your set like people, you know, and not try to ostracize them. Why on earth did Kubrick go to so much trouble to protect Danny Lloyd from the fact that he was making a horror movie? Danny Lloyd did not know he was in a horror movie. He thought he was wow. in a a movie about a a drama a drama about a family who lives in a hotel and like even the scene where we were just talking about where she like picks him up because she realizes or she thinks that jack is the one who ripped his sweater and hurt his neck that's like a life-size dummy she picked him up because stanley kubrick didn't want to traumatize danny lloyd by having him act in that scene where the mom is accusing the dad of having hurt him what you went to all that trouble to protect danny lloyd i'm glad you did that Meanwhile, Shelley Duvall's hair is falling out because you've so traumatized her. Right. <laughs> Physically ill for months. Yes. Yes. So, no, Kubrick, <laughs> you don't get a pass from me on that. I'm sorry. If you could no. have tre- if you treated Danny Lloyd that well, where you were that interested in protecting him as a person, you could have protected Shelley Duvall. And still got a great performance and out of Danny Lloyd. And still got a great. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. yep. Went to a screening of uh, The Shining where Leon Vitali was uh, a guest speaker, and he was in Barry Lyndon. And after mm. on Barry Lyndon, and afterwards, he just started calling up Stanley Kubrick, saying, "Can I help you? Can I come just sort of be wow. like on your movie?" So he um, on The Shining, he ended up being the sort of Danny Lloyd Wrangler, like he was the the second unit director, if you want to call it, for for the actor Danny Lloyd, and also for Arlie Ermey in Full Metal Jacket, which is kind of a funny side by side. But the fact that Kubrick was like, I'm just going to have one person be in charge of this child and make sure that he's okay, as you were saying, you know, so he told stories about that. But I had I just had a weird flashback to a scene that I directed in college from a David Mamet play. And I thought a lot about who I wanted to cast. And then I got these three women who I thought would be great. And I cast them. And then we showed up to the first rehearsal and they were just fantastic. And mm-hmm. I was like, well, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> 
and it was such an interesting, you know, like you, that sort of philosophy of, of, you know, you have to suffer in order to make your thing perfect and mm. whatever. And it's like, sometimes, sometimes maybe the work you do beforehand or just making sure everyone's on the same page about what you're making. Like sometimes you can, you can knock it out of the park and and, and that's it. You know, just I wasn't really talented actors. Right. Yeah. I wasn't making a movie. So all I needed them to do was say their lines and walk around, but you know, there's a whole lot more going into making a movie, obviously. And I'm not going to pretend there isn't, but I just sort of had to have a conversation with myself and say, Hey, if it's working the way it is, don't don't mess with that. Yeah. Like, you don't you don't have to uh, suffer. It can right. be good without suffering, ideally. Right. Yeah. Even <laughs> it's kind of interesting because now I'm thinking about what you're saying, Alex, about this kind of being a movie about writing and the the weird why it's worse sometimes when you've removed all excuses of right. why you're not doing well. That like sometimes like suffering, you can warp that to be like, but I am still like I'm doing it because I feel terrible, so I'm <laughs> right. still yeah. making art, uh -huh. and it's, I feel like I literally have five months to myself to write, which is like what I've said Dream all this time life. I needed yeah. to write this book, and now I'm not writing it is a very disturbing place to be. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it, and it goes back to the responsibility of the writer, and and I think that this is something that Stephen King wrestles with a lot. One of my favorite Stephen King novels is one that I've never met anybody else who's ever read it. It's called Lisey's Story. And because it's very much not one of his most popular books and has not been made into a movie, but it's about, basically it's about the wife of a horror writer. And so like this, this like very famous writer of horror fiction novels has died. And now his wife is sort of left trying to like hold his legacy a little bit. But also there's an extent in the book to which he was very, really haunted by the horror worlds that he created. And so so after he passes away, she too ends up being sort of very, really haunted mm. by his intellectual properties of like horror things <laughs> that he made. And I think that this, you know, Stephen King throughout his work has really grappled with okay i mean i was just watching yeah watching the shining again this week i was like man can you imagine being someone who has spent that much of your life stephen king that much of your life thinking of ways to terrify and torture other humans <laughs> like that is he spent so much of his time thinking about how to scare people that's what he sits around and does and then to try to be a person at the same time a father, a husband, a decent guy, essentially, as uh, you know, my impression that he is or has really, really tried to be. It's so obvious to see all of that boiled to the surface in The Shining, this sort of the duality of it, all the mirror imaging that's in here and, and all this stuff and the potential downfall of failing to do that, failing to be a good person while also trying to be a good writer. And also feeling like you're you're probably going insane a lot as a writer. Yeah. And especially if you're writing disturbing Exactly. Things, you probably start to feel like a psychopath yourself after, exactly. after a while. Yeah, for sure. Hi, everybody. It's Trisha. Just wanted to take a quick moment and thank you all for listening to Beyond the Screenplay. If you like the podcast as much as we like making it for you, we would really love for you to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. And if you want, it would help us out a lot if you could support us on Patreon. For just $2 a month, patrons get extra content like mini episodes and Q&As. And it's a pretty cheap price and it really, really helps us a lot. So thanks and back to the episode. It's interesting that this movie seems to be interestingly about the creative process, both in the plot Mm -hmm. and in the making of like I think mm. there's a lot of things Meta, to analyze yeah. and think about and that's probably why it, it has lasted so long and why it intrigues me so much more than most horror movies like I think there's just a lot of things to think about and pull lessons from when looking at The Shining so why don't we go around and pull oh. lessons <laughs> what lessons are we going to take away from The Shining? Trisha, do you want to go first? Sure um, my lesson is actually from Diane Johnson because she I was reading an interview with her and she said this the procedure that Kubrick advised which I've followed ever since is to get the order of the scenes right decide on the 120 most essential scenes and then work with the structure until you get it right bearing in mind the themes and the need for characterization and all of the things that you should bear in mind so I think that the shining works because the order of the scenes are right if I can put it that way where it's 
that you know going back to what we were saying of we have Danny's sort of first flash really early on that disorients us from the outset but then even the scenes which we haven't we didn't even talk about Scatman uh Crothers <laughs> who I love so much so in good. this movie yeah but the scene where he's explaining the supernatural stuff setting up some of that stuff all of that is paced so well throughout and they were worried that this movie was going to be like it would be criticized for being sort of slowly paced for a horror movie, which to me, it's just like the tension is so high the entire time. I'm not, there's not one moment where I feel relaxed when I'm watching it, but I think it is because of that, the order of the scenes we have enough. Yeah. I don't know. I, they're all just sort of stacked that way. And then, and you were mentioning the different chapter headings mm-hmm. and you mentioned it in your video too, that, yeah. that feel like they're moving us forward towards some inevitable end point. It's great. Just to comment on that really quickly, the escalation yes. it kind of happens very quickly. You know, like mm-hmm. they're not at the hotel that long before things start to get bad and then worse and then worse and then worse. You know, it's it's before the midpoint of the movie, we've already had uh the kid strangled by a ghost and <laughs> like yeah. you know, like like things escalate more quickly than they would even in a different horror movie potentially. Where yeah. you kind of wait till after the midpoint for things to start really going wrong. Um, so the movie really it doesn't wait long to escalate, which I really appreciate. But somehow there's like still trajectory to it. Like it, mm. it yes. never feels like it doesn't know where it's going. Yeah. Like mm. there's weirdly this this confidence I have when watching it of like, you know where you're going. And so even though all this crazy stuff has happened, has already happened, I know that there's going to be more and there's a reason that I'm seeing what I'm seeing now. Like, and I think, again, what you were saying, Trisha, I think I think that's good evidence for that, that the, the structure is put together such that it it is exactly happening what's supposed to be happening is happening exactly when it's supposed to be and also at the same time escalating just enough to keep us moving toward this terrifying ending yeah Math. i'm i'm writing a, it is <laughs> i'm writing a movie right now and before i sat down and wrote anything i just wrote the scenes like a two three word here's the scene the scene and i numbered them you know there's like 40 of them or whatever and just numbered them, shuffled them around until I felt good about the order, and then I sat down and started writing. And I there's it's like only, a science, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> when it's when it's not like living in a nightmare world. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that, yeah, that's writing. It's like on one side there's a lot of intellectual science intentionality. On the other hand, you're going insane, quietly going insane. And somewhere in there, something gets made. I feel like the duality is so perfectly encompassed when Jack goes, I'm not going to hurt you, Wendy. I'm not going to hurt you. I'm not going to hurt you. I'm going to bash your brains in, but I'm not going to hurt you. <laughs> like, <laughs> like you, get the sense, you get the <laughs> sense scene. actually that he means all of those sentences when he says them. As he says them. As he says them. Right. Right. So good. (laughs) Brian? I was remembering watching this movie in college with a couple of friends uh, on my my dorm floor. And uh, my friend Tyrone, we were in his room watching the movie. And he would cut to, you know, Crank Wednesday. And he'd just go... And then some weird, you know, the tricycle scene would happen or whatever. And he goes, <laughs> and eventually we went, Tyrone, why are you laughing? And he goes, because it's so scary. <laughs> <laughs> and that was like his defense mechanism. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I love it. And I think it's, you know, it's uh, some, for me, the lesson is sort of, it's what we were talking about of the, the unknowable quality of the movie of the sort of this feeling of, you're grounded because because as you said Trisha it is a simple story but you're also you can't quite find your footing you don't ever know what's coming literally around the corner um <laughs> mm-hmm. and uh and it's also just like Kubrick does things in a weird way where it's that sort of thing we've talked about a lot where when you know the proper quote unquote way to make a film if you just make a film the proper way it's probably not going to do much it's probably not gonna it, people oh that was a that was a proper film and i forgot about it the next day you know i think one of the reasons kubrick has sort of gone down in history as as one of the most renowned filmmakers is the fact that he he knows what he's doing he knows the rules and how to break them you know the old the old classic saying but he just does things in a weird enough way where you're like why is there like a weird like naked woman above dick halloran's bed and like why (laughs) why is danny like making that face and why is he just like there's so many just unsettling things 
that could only come out of, you know, that mind basically, but they're sort of held together by the glue of this fairly simple movie. And I think it's just finding that balance is a really cool thing that I, that I think is just a fascinating thing to talk about with this movie. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Alex, we kind of covered it before, but I think just the way that he makes so many scenes that on paper, especially in the first half of the movie would read as almost boring, like just kind of, small talk scenes uh just kind of asking each other some basic questions of how's the writing coming how how you doing like what's going on like danny are you enjoying the hotel <laughs> like all those scenes i find terrifying and i'm on the edge <laughs> of my seat mm-hmm. because of the performances because of the music because of just the way it's all being presented like something is just deeply wrong yeah. even though it's almost like the most boring everyday conversations happening in a very like almost superficial way between people and you know if, if jack nicholson is involved in those conversations then they have the jack nicholson subtext of sure. his face is creeping me out um <laughs> i and i just love that and i think kubrick does that in a lot of his movies actually yeah. he has people being very polite and kind of having these very almost just proper conversations with an unnerving subtext underneath mm-hmm. them or just a lot of subtext happening and so it just was a good, the good lesson for me was if you have built in a really a compelling arc in the subtext, the surface text can be very plain. Mm. You can be having a polite conversation between two people, but so much can be happening that is not being said. And I think this movie is full of that. And yeah. it's and it's and it's so much better than if they were saying what they were actually feeling. It's actually much more compelling to watch Shelley Duvall try to act normal when she's kind of freaking out inside. Totally. Yeah. Michael. So I've been kind of thinking this whole time about my, you know, outburst about art of science and all that all that <laughs> stuff uh, <laughs> and trying to find a way to clarify or maybe explain myself better and I don't know that I can, but I think what I find so fascinating about this movie is that you know, it is intentionally ambiguous, like we were talking about. It does feel, I, I agreed with everything you guys said, by the way, we're like, there is something about this film that feels like the ambiguity is on purpose and was constructed to create an effect and it's doing it in a way that a movie that's just bad and accidentally has plot holes like wouldn't or couldn't. And I think those are the kinds of puzzles that like activate me. Like those are the things I want I think I, I get upset at, you know, analyses that are like, well, the architecture was purposefully confusing. Like, even if it was like, I, I think that's an interesting thing, but I that feels too simplistic to me in some ways. Or I think just the way people respond to ambiguity sometimes is to reach for, oh, well, this thing happened. And that must be like they reach for simple conclusions, things that can plug in easily and, and feel like explanations. And I feel like I want to get to the bottom of it like it's not enough for me almost and so I think I have to kind of embody this hyper analytical like I'm going to read a paper about creepiness until I realize that that's how it all plugs in together like there's just something that I find value in not because I I disagree with everyone but but because I I'm not personally satisfied by the answers that are provided and I feel like this film is like a infinite gold mine of that where It feels like nothing should work as well as it does, but somehow it's all amazing and perfect. And I want to know why everything works always in this movie. We'll let you go back to the mothership for now. Okay. (laughs) So wait, what was the lesson? I don't know. (laughs) The the Shining is good. Humans are an interesting species, and I don't yet quite understand why (laughs) they... What is creepiness? (laughs) No, exactly, but like ask those questions and like go answer cry? it. Don't just be like, oh, it's human. <laughs> no, yeah, why do you cry? Uh, I'll be over here. <laughs> I, I, I really respect what you're getting at, Michael, because I think I maybe I'm just more lazy than you are, where I just kind of, I think there's intuition. There's these kind of magical humanistic things that we can channel through our, ourselves as actors or actors too, but as directors, filmmakers, creatives that I don't know that I even want to nail it down into a science because that kind of ruins the magic for me. I mean, I think, I think you probably could nail it down to a science if you tried hard enough, but I think it's, 
there's there's a magic loving part of me that likes keeping it magic. But if it's magic, like you can't wield it. Like you have no control over it. If it's something that's just completely intentional. But maybe you're not meant to have like total control over it in the same way you have control over like a chemical. Maybe well, it's supposed to be just an art. intuitive <laughs> Well, and I think that's, channel you can get that's into, fine yeah. for like appreciating it. But if you watch a movie like The Shining and you're like, man, there's just something magical about that. It's like you don't then go and sit down and be like, OK, now I'm going to do magical. Like well, you have I, to I think, understand. I mean, he, he made sure. choices. And I'm just wondering if those choices were as analytical as you're hoping they were or no, if they, they were not deeply been. intuitive in a way that can't be reconstructed. Well, and I feel like, that, yeah, I guess that feels like just giving up then or just no, like appreciating it. No, it's, a, it's it. a balance. It's always a balance. It's it's knowing the math and knowing the science and stuff like that, but then also following your intuition yeah. and finding that thing that, that can only come out of your gut and your brain. Yes. And, and so much of Stephen King's writing is about his exact process of writing and how dark and mysterious it is and how it takes you to these like psychologically confusing places where you don't understand yourself where this stuff comes out of because we are all so mysterious to ourselves that there's a great extent to which like even a piece of art that you create you are never going to fully be able to plumb its steps and so you know it was funny what you were saying reminded me of a uh, I was talking to somebody recently and I was like, man, when I was like six or seven years old, I just feel like I was had access to this magic and and like my imagination was so magical and it was so easy to access it, you mm -hmm. know, kind of thing. And I'm just sort of like sad that I feel like I've lost that to an extent. And my friend that was talking to me was like, yeah, yeah, maybe maybe it is a lot harder now and you had magic then, but what you practice now is sorcery. And ultimately that's a lot stronger. Like the more that you sit down to study what it is that you are doing. And so for that reason, I don't like to talk about writing as though it is magic, but in the same way that we are all unknowable to each other, we are unknowable to ourselves. And so, you know, you could try to pin Stanley Kubrick into a chair and like even seat him next to Stephen King, which would be a weird, probably very unpleasant situation, and try to get them both to fully explain every single thing that they have ever thought about The Shining. But you still wouldn't actually be able to put that lightning in a bottle in the way that we're talking about, other than the way that it's actually already captured on celluloid on our screens. So next time I, someone asks you if you're a writer, say, no, I'm a goddamn sorcerer. I'm a sorcerer. <laughs> <laughs> That is pretty cool as a as an idea. Mm. Sorcery. I have more thoughts, but we'll save them for the next podcast. Oh, it's my. an ongoing conversation. See, yeah. I mean, of yeah. course. Like I just said, there's no end to it. Yeah. What's everyone been watching, listening to, doing recently? Alex. <laughs> so I just finally started watching the HBO show Succession because um, I've been hearing great mm -hmm. things about it, especially season two, which is out now. And uh, I watched the pilot. I haven't gotten further than that, but it's off to a good start. Um, I think I kind of resisted the show for a bit because Logline basically is a kind of Rupert Murdoch media mogul billionaire type guy has uh, children who want to take over his company. And I I just am so like grossed out by the way the world is. I was yeah. like, do I really want to watch a show about like billionaires fighting over money and like being an evil media company? Mm -hmm. But it's, it's uh, directed by Adam McKay. And he did a great movie called The Big Short a few years ago, which I thought was like a miracle movie because it actually explained the financial crisis to me, <laughs> yeah. which I'd never understood really before. Um, and I, I know his politics and I know kind of like that he has kind of a mission to his filmmaking nowadays to really also kind of educate through entertainment. Yeah. And I mean, Anchorman, I think, did that too. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I, I knowing it was in his hands, and I could even tell in the first episode there is um, an ethical core to the show mm -hmm. that is not just like reveling in like rich people being bitchy to each other. Right. You know, it's it's about more than that, about deeper themes than that. And so I'm excited to see where it goes. And I love um, Kieran Culkin is already yes. my, is already my favorite. He's yes. just so freaking great. I yeah. love him. Nice. So check it out. When you were talking, Michael, about uh, Big Little Lies season two, the idea of bringing a show back to do another episode, another season. Um, I've been watching the final season of Orange is the New Black, which is the seventh season. And I think there's another interesting thing, which is shows that go on for so long that no one's watching anymore. Like The Walking Dead is doing that right now, where I remember three years ago, my friends and I been like, oh, what do you think happened? And what do you think? Da, da, da. Now, I don't know anyone who's still watching The Walking Dead. 
I kept watching Orange is the New Black almost feeling like I was kind of pot committed. Like, well, I watched four seasons. I might as well watch the fifth. But the fourth season of that show, I've never seen a season of a show where I felt like the writers literally spun a wheel of characters and then spun a wheel of plots and were like, well, this character does this now. And you never knew about it, but now they do this. So I was kind of wishy-washy with the show. But the seventh season, I think, is one of the strongest seasons uh, since the beginning of the show, and I'm really enjoying it. And it's just nice to be watching the show again, being excited to watch it after a couple seasons of going, well, I like this plot to it, but not this, and I don't like this thing at all, and I don't like the main character, and that's a problem. Um, But uh, I will say that if you were watching the show and stopped watching the show, I would recommend uh, making it, going back and revisiting it and watching till the end. I feel like sometimes just having, knowing that it's the end. Definitely. Knowing that, okay, now we know where we're going can right. kind of bring some of that magic back. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Mm, totally. Yeah. Trisha. So I went and saw Hustlers, mm. um, which is the movie. It's out right now, written and directed by Loreen Scafaria, starring, of course, J-Lo, who is such a goddess at all moments in that movie. She's so good in it. Uh, Constance Wu is fabulous in it. Like everybody, everybody is so good in it. And you know what? It's not a perfect movie, but damn, it's a lot of fun. It's great. I, I just had so much fun watching it. And, and it actually weirdly, so it deals with a time period that stretches over the financial crisis and it's based on a true story. So it's it's actually adapted from an in-depth, investigative article <laughs> right. um, and about how the the crash, how the crash in 2008 affected all of these other industries that were dependent upon Wall Street and all of this stuff, including, you know, the exotic dancer industry. And so it's really, really good. And everyone's amazing in it. And it's kind of like a revenge fantasy in some ways, but it's also based on a true story. And it's about sisterhood. And it's fabulous. It just made me wish that there were more movies like this. So uh, it is making its money. I hope that leads to like a lot more chances on these kinds of films, because obviously there's market for it. Awesome. Yeah, I'm excited to see that. It's great. (laughs) For my movie, a thing that I watched recently, it requires a little bit of a setup, but Trisha, Trisha's friend, Sean Eastridge, Mm -hmm. has a podcast called Missing Frames. Mm -hmm. And the whole premise of the podcast is that he has a guest on and he forces that guest to watch a movie that they should have seen, but they have not seen yep. yet. And you were on, right? I was what, on it. What I did movie an, did you watch? I did an episode with him about AI. Oh, Spielberg's that's right. Spielberg's AI, because right. it was like a hole in my Spielberg filmography. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's a lot of fun because there's often this weight associated with a movie that you haven't seen and haven't seen and you know you should have. Right. And there, that was very much the case for me. Uh, and so it being Halloween time, uh, the movie that I chose, I guess, to watch that I had not seen uh, it was The Exorcist. So I have finally seen The Exorcist and uh-huh. the structure of the podcast is cool because like I, I talked to Sean before, we talk about what uh, my expectations are going into the movie and then go watch the movie and come back and report back. I'm really excited to hear this. Yeah, well, so the link is in the show notes to the episode. It, it is out now and it was fun. It was, it was a lot of interesting thoughts. Uh, that I won't share here because I go into detail about them on the podcast. But so The Exorcist is the movie that I saw. If you want to hear my thoughts, check out the podcast in the show notes. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Well, this has been our episode on The Shining. Thank you very much for listening. Hit us up on Twitter. We'd love to hear from you. Yeah. And everyone have a very happy Halloween and we'll see you in the next episode. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.